morning. Welcome to each one of you here. Um, pretty good size audience this morning. Uh, th this paragraph right before the service starts is really appropriate today. Peace, peace. There is no peace. Boy, we're seeing lots of riots and stuff like that. I guess uh, this is really appropriate for this particular Sunday. Let us begin with hymn number 905, Come Thou Almighty King. Uh, this starts out with uh, looking at the first verse, the Father, the second verse, the Son, and the third verse, the Holy Spirit, and the last verse, the Holy Trinity. And we'll stand up for that last verse. decrees. Great is, Great is your mercy, O Lord. Lord. Give me O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, I a poor miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your punishment now and forever. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you on your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy innocence, bitter sufferings, and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor and sinful being. Upon this confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I assure you of the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. May he who began this good work within you bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Look upon my suffering and deliver me. For I have not forgotten your law. Defend my cause and redeem me. Preserve my life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked. For they do not seek out your decrees. Your 
compassion, Lord, is great. Preserve my life according to your laws. Many are the foes who pursue me. But I have not turned to your statutes. I look on the faithless with loathing. For they do not obey your word. See how they love, see how I love your precepts. Preserve my life, Lord, in accordance with your love. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the working of your Holy Spirit, grant that we may gladly hear your word, proclaim it among us, and follow its directing through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. first reading today is from Jeremiah 28, verses 5 to 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah replied to the prophet Hananiah before the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. He said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words you have prophesied by bringing the articles of the Lord's house and all the exiles back to this place from Babylon. Nevertheless, listen to what I have to say in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. From early times, the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, and plague <coughs> against many countries and great kingdoms. But the prophet who prophesies this peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Our second reading is from Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as that long as that person lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies... She is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries as another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, 
deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is, commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Hallelujah. Would you please stand for the reading of the Gospel? The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 42. Glory to you, o Lord. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciples, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hallelujah. And you may be seated. We'll sing the... Uh, Next hymn, uh, hymn asking for direction. Oh, that the Lord would guide my ways. Uh, it will be sung to a different tune than you may ordinarily be familiar with. <laughs> titled, Forget the Law. It's based on uh, Romans chapter 7, the epistle for today. Would you pray with me? Dear Father in heaven, we ask that your Holy Spirit be present among us, both with those who are watching online, as well as those here at church, as we consider the law and its restraints on us. 
May this sermon be a blessing to each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You so often see individual verses pulled out of the Bible in order to prove some point. For example, in our text, we see Romans 7, verse 6, where it says, But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written law. We've been released from the law. The written law in the Old Testament can be divided into three different categories of law, the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the political or civil law. The ceremonial law concerned what people should eat, how they should dress, and that sort of thing, and the political or civil laws were the laws enacted by governments. The ceremonial laws were, for the most part, completely dropped for the New Testament church shortly after Christ ascended to heaven. But what is being discussed here is the moral law, the Ten Commandments and that sort of thing. So it appears we can ignore the Ten Commandments and whatever else is included in the law, this is backed up by other passages like Galatians 5.18 where it says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. We don't have to follow the Ten Commandments, right? Something smells fishy here. That doesn't make sense. We can't steal or murder or whatever. Our society would fall apart. We need to look a little closer at this. Paul presents some rather complex logic explaining why the words, you are not under the law, are appropriate. Today we'll try to expand his arguments and hopefully unravel this logic. The text in verse 10 makes the obvious statement that laws govern the behavior of a person no longer apply to him after that person dies. That's obvious. This is true of all laws. But then the text notes that in addition to one's own death, this same principle is sometimes applied upon the death of someone else. He uses the example that the marriage vow no longer applies to you if your spouse dies. In fact, in the marriage ceremony, partners vow that they will remain united until death do us part. After the death of one spouse, the other is released and is no longer bound by the vows that that surviving free, uh, spouse is free of the marriage laws and may marry or not as they choose, totally free of any legal restraints. The law didn't have to change to allow the survivor to say that the law no longer bound them to those vows. But then Paul expands his scope. The Ten Commandments are a good example of the moral laws that God asks everyone to obey. These laws certainly apply to all who are part of this sinful world, and Paul confesses a curious personal experience. He says in verse 7, For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said you shall not covet. To covet is defined by Webster as to feel an inordinate desire for what belongs to another. But Paul follows this with a confession. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. Why was Paul troubled by this particular commandment? Apparently these thoughts were due to a spirit of rebellion by Paul. In verse 5 he says, When we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us. It was that rebellion that caused this sinful response. You see, Paul was trained as a Pharisee and lived that life before Christ appeared to him on his way to Damascus. So he probably had an attitude like many of the other Pharisees that challenged Jesus Christ in his ministry. From Jesus' encounters with them, we see that they had a somewhat puffed up image of themselves, and along with that, 
probably ranked themselves against other Pharisees so that coveting each other's circumstances was an accepted thing to do. They had an external concept of the law that if an art act could be could not be observed by God, then it was not sinful. And although Pharisees considered themselves as the living epitome of righteousness, it appears that after Christ found and converted Paul, he regarded his time as a Pharisee as a misguided and even sinful phase of his life because verse 5 says, For when we are in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. This fruit for death means that all the good works that he thought he was doing were actually in the opposite category. Note that the ninth and 10th commandment on coveting were the laws that forbid sinful thoughts rather than sinful acts. So for a Pharisee, coveting was never done because it was an external act unless one followed through on temptation to covet since that meant that one would steal or lie or defraud in order to obtain that item, and those sins were covered by other commandments, not coveting. If one could afford to buy the item, then the coveting thoughts never came up. So the coveting commandments were never a problem for a good Pharisee like Paul. So it appears that after his conversion, Paul became aware that sinning was not an external act, and it was not ex just external sins that God could see, but included sinful thoughts as well. So Paul realized that the coveting commandments were condemning him. God knew Paul's obvious covetous thoughts, so it was a sin, even if he didn't follow through to get the coveted item. Saul's, Paul's covetous sin was stirred up in his head with God's Spirit shining and illuminating it like dust and dirt in the air stirred up in a room and illuminated by sunlight from a window. You've seen this before. The room looks completely clear. You pull up a shade, the ray shines in, and all of a sudden you see all this dust and dirt in the air. The law had made Paul very much aware of his sin, and another point that should be mentioned is the result of rebellion. The child who is told that he can't have the candy right before a meal causes him to want it that much more. <laughs> Paul refers to this rebellion caused by the sin when he says in verse 5, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us. But this doesn't explain why we're no longer under the law. I'm getting there. That's next. It starts with a relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. A bond of love that is very much like the bond of love between a husband and a wife. In Ephesians 5.25 we're told, Husbands, love your wife just as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. By the church here is not meant the church buildings or even the church denomination. It means the Christian believers, the people. And that's who Christ loves. And just as the death of a husband means that the marriage laws no longer apply to the wife, so the death of Christ on our behalf allows us to also put away the life ruled by sin. That sin-dominated phase of our life is over, in a sense. That phase of our life has died, and we are no, no longer ruled by sin, but by the love for an example of Christ. Verse 4 says, So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. Note there's two deaths involved here. The death of Christ on our behalf and the death of the mindset of our following our sinful thoughts and desires as defined by the law. So now we're not condemned to hell by the law. We have been freed from that 
condemnation. The combination of deaths are abbreviated by the words, we are no longer under the law. Just as the marriage laws didn't change for the survivors to be able to say the law didn't apply to them at the death of a spouse, so after the death of Christ for our sins, us surviving Christians can say that we are no longer ruled by sins and the laws that define them. That phase of our life died when Christ died, and we are now ruled by Christ. But since we're no longer under the law, can we now claim that Paul told us we have permission to violate the law? No, not even a little bit. But the punishment associated with those sins, we no longer have to suffer. Christ carried that punishment. So what is the purpose of the law, of any law? First, the law helps us control violent outbursts. It acts as a curb. 1 Timothy 1, 9 says, We also know that the law is not made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers. The law also acts as a, a, a mirror in that it shows us our sin. Romans 3.20 says, Through the law we become conscious of our sins. And the third, the law acts as a guide defining good behavior for us and teaching us what we should and should not do. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? by living according to your word. There's a shocking thing that's been happening these past several weeks. People are saying that a person was mistakenly killed by a policeman, so all police are bad, and because police are the ones that enforce the law, that that gives all the other people the freedom to violate the law that they choose. That doesn't make sense. Everyone makes mistakes, just as everyone is a sinner. And someone must enforce the laws. The people who break the laws are usually not very nice people. And if they break the laws, then they have an incentive to try to evade the police. This evading of the police has become more and more common in our as our nation has moved farther and farther away from our Christian roots. Firing bullets at police is expected when a criminal carries a gun, whether the criminal is robbing a store, selling illicit drugs, or arguing with his wife. The police have a very dangerous job, so that everyone who is stopped and questioned by the police must bear in mind this policeman may have been assaulted in the past by someone who he stopped, so he'll be watching for any indication of, of attack. It would be wise to make sure that your remarks and your movements do not indicate that you will attack him or try to escape. Running back, running, returning back to the policeman who mistakenly killed the man, that's a serious error that must be avoided, but we still must allow the police to do their job in the safest way possible while preserving the freedoms of our citizens. How that is corrected must be done very carefully. Let's also talk a bit about prejudice. In the course of our lives, we observe people and their behavior and link these two together. As a teenage paper boy, I found that people who lived in apartments often moved out without warning and without paying. I was prejudiced against these people and my response was to make sure that apartment dwellers never got behind by more than two weeks. I'd go back several times to make sure that they never got behind more than two weeks. Not all apartment dwellers would cheat me, but when a new person moved in, I initially put them in the category of people who might. That's prejudice. Assuming that a person in a certain way will have the same behavior as everyone else in that category. 
It's judging a person not based on what he does, but based on the acts of other people that have some characteristic that he also has. Prejudice starts before a child can even talk. You've seen it. A person with dark hair wants to pick up the baby, but the child's family are all blondes, and he's never seen anybody with dark hair before. All people who look different from his family members are put in the category of being a threat to him, to which he responds by screaming. As a child gets older, he meets good people with dark hair, good people with glasses, good people with mustaches, and so on so so then they don't scream but still I've seen kindergartners who are scared stiff by a clown the clown is in the category of being different so he must be a threat in these cases the person is judged not on the demonstrated behavior of others in his same category but rather on the feared not demonstrated behavior of others this is a self-preservation behavior that God seems to have built into every child and the parent tries to teach the child acceptance as he grows. If God gave babies this prejudice, then it must be good. Is prejudice wrong? I don't believe that prejudice can categorically be condemned such as the self-preservation pre prejudice of a child. In fact, I believe most prejudices have a self-preservation basis. But we need to consider the categories on which prejudices are defined. We can choose to opt in or out of some categories a teenager with long hair being categorized with troublemakers can cut his hair. A stinky person with dirty clothes and a smirk on his face might also be put in the category of troublemakers, but he can clean up his act. A drunkard can stop drinking. In these three examples, the person can change the category into which uh, he has been placed. The treatment that these people receive is in a direction to encourage them to change and become like everyone else. If they change, we lose the variety of appearances in our society. And if they don't, it can just be considered as the cost they choose to be in that category. The difficulty arises when a person has been placed in a certain category by God and he cannot get out of that category. Some things that come to mind are the color of one's skin, blindness, deafness, crippled legs, Down syndrome, and so forth. I believe that these inborn characteristics need to each be considered individually. The color of one's skin has been shown to be just that, part of one's appearance with no coordination with one's personality, character, intelligence, ingenuity, and most other characteristics. These people are not deficient in any way. God loves them just like any other individual, and they need God just like we do. We need to treat them accordingly. The negative attitudes because of skin color is certainly wrong, and the rest of the characteristics on my list above are completely different. These people have true disabilities. We need to aid and assist them in any way we can or use our experiences with one individual to guide our efforts to aid others with that same disability. Then remember that God loves them and wants their love and devotion just as much as ours. In summary, prejudices can be either good or bad. So we're back to the question of whether we need to be concerned with the moral laws. Of course we need to be concerned and follow the laws God has crafted for us. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And from a positive viewpoint, 1 Timothy 4.8 says 
godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And may the peace of God keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
join in singing the hymn 923, Almighty Father, bless the word. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love and inspiration of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Hallelujah. Go in peace and serve the Lord in some special way this week. We will with the help of God. Grace.